Okay, so I actually wanted to start this video with a simulation of the event that a lot of us will not be witnessing in real life. The 2024 totality, or the total solar eclipse. And this is of course using Space Engine, which in the last few years has become realistic enough to be able to recreate these events in real time. And so on April 8th of 2024, North America is going to be witnessing this. So there is that shadow of the moon slowly approaching California and basically moving through the entire North America toward the Northeast. Interestingly, as you can see, because this is just a simulation, because some of the areas are now in complete darkness, we suddenly start to see city lights. But in reality, it's unlikely to happen. And so in case you missed the event, there you go. You kind of just saw it from outer space. And so in this video, I actually wanted to discuss solar eclipses and their importance in history, especially when it comes to science. Because quite a lot of scientific discoveries have been made during solar eclipses, and pretty much all solar eclipses in the last few decades have always been followed by some kind of a scientific investigation. And this year is no exception. And so in this video, let's talk about the history of science when it comes to totalities, and of course, what scientific experiments are going to be conducted this year. And though obviously these events are kind of special, in reality they actually happen every 18 months. And so every year and a half, somewhere on the planet, we're going to be observing this. But when it comes to the same location, that's a different story. For exactly the same spot to experience totality twice, you would have to wait at least 375 years on average. But it's really only in the beginning of the 19th century that we started approaching these events as something scientific. Before 1801, for the most part, eclipses were either seen as descriptive or in most cases, astrological in nature. They would usually lead to some kind of a prediction or some kind of a omen, very often a negative one. As a matter of fact, the first mentioning of a solar eclipse in any historical accounts is from 2137 BC in China. This is from the Book of Documents, also known as Shu Jing, which recounts the classic history. And these documents were actually very likely compiled by Confucius himself. And so here, in a document that's over 3000 years old, there is a recount of the first ever solar eclipse. And finally enough, or I guess maybe tragically enough, because this event was not foreseen by astrologers in ancient China, and a couple of them were caught drunk, those two actually ended up being executed for essentially not doing their job and terrifying the emperor. But that's in essence how these solar eclipses used to be seen. There are so many different recounts from ancient history of entire armies basically retreating, for example in Persia or in ancient Greece, because some of the battles coincided with some kind of a solar eclipse. But during the early 19th century, and especially after the invention of a lot of things like, for example, spectrograph or even our ability to take photographs, that's when things became a lot more scientific. And it's the eclipse in 1806 that basically serves as a kind of a foundation for the scientific study of eclipses. This image was created by the Spanish astronomer José de Ferrer, who witnessed the unusual formation around the moon during the eclipse, realizing that it was actually part of the sun, which he then named using the Latin word for crown, because it basically resembled one. This was the discovery of corona. And it was actually this discovery that even led to the invention of coronagraph, that today is widely used in a lot of different telescopes to basically cover the sun in order to study the corona or objects around the sun. Another major discovery was made just a few years after. During the eclipse in 1836, the English astronomer Francis Bailey was able to finally explain the unusual bead-like formations that actually happen during the complete totality. You can actually see them right here, as visible in this image, and they basically represent these unusual bead-like light formations around the moon. And he was basically able to explain these unusual openings as essentially different geological formations on the surface of the moon, as sunlight passes through various valleys and between various mountains on the moon, letting some of the light pass through. And since then, since 1836, they've been referred to as the Bailey's Beads, which is one of the phenomena that you should be looking out for if you're going to be witnessing a totality anytime soon. They only become visible for a few seconds and disappear pretty quickly afterwards. But one of the biggest breakthroughs was in 1851, and you can probably guess what this is. Literally the first ever photograph or first ever actual image of a total solar eclipse, taken on July 28th in a Prussian observatory by Yo 
Johann Julius Friedrich Berkowski, making this the first ever scientifically useful photograph, which can also be seen in several paintings that were created around this time. And around this time the researchers started using other additional devices to try to look at the sun when it's covered by the moon. One of the first devices used was a spectrograph, the device that allows us to see the spectrum, which then reveals absorption lines allowing us to see what sort of elements are inside. And so during a total eclipse in 1868 that happened in India, a French astronomer, Jules Janssen, was able to discover an unusual wavelength we've never seen before, 587.49 nanometers. This was detected inside the chromosphere of the Sun during the eclipse. And this was the discovery of an element we've never knew existed until then. And though at first he actually thought it was just sodium, later on, within just a few years, it was discovered to be a new thing, a completely new element. And because it was discovered in the Sun, or I guess on the Sun, and because it was assumed to be caused by the Sun itself, they decided to name it after the Greek word for the Sun, Helios. Today we know it as Helium, making the total eclipse in 1868 one of the biggest in terms of scientific discoveries. And around the same time they actually discovered another unusual element they initially referred to as coronium, because it was in the corona of the Sun. But turns out that coronium was basically just a superheated iron. Iron that starts to emit certain frequencies when heated to millions of degrees. And that created a new mystery. For some reason corona was super hot, much 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 hotter than the surface of the Sun itself. It's still a mystery today, but we're getting a little bit closer to solving it. Some of the videos in the description provide certain explanations. But it's of course the eclipse of 1919 that today is still seen as the most important in terms of scientific achievements. This was based on a famous expedition by Sir Arthur Eddington, who essentially wanted to confirm an unusual theory proposed by a somewhat unknown German scientist who started to make claims that, for some reason, maybe just maybe, light is not always straight and tends to bend, especially when there is a lot of gravity. And one of the ways this could be proven is by observing the stars extremely close to the Sun during a total eclipse. If the German was correct, the gravity from the Sun would actually bend the light just a little bit, making the star appear in a slightly different location compared to its regular location in the night skies. And so here by marking a negative photo of the 1919 solar eclipse and then examining the positions of various stars close to the Sun, Eddington basically confirmed that this unusual scientist, Albert Einstein, was apparently correct, basically leading to an almost overnight theme for Einstein. And today we know this proposition as the theory of general relativity, something that has been proven time and time again. Interestingly, the prediction itself was only made in 1915, four years prior. And so in between the initial proposition and the final proof, it only took something like five years. But naturally this was one of the most groundbreaking discoveries when it comes to modern physics and something that we still widely use today in regular life without even realizing. You might want to check out some of the videos about, for example, GPS or just satellites in general that relies on all of these ideas to a great extent. But the eclipse in 2024 is going to be no different. There are going to be a lot of different types of studies conducted during the eclipse, with many of them focusing on different things. We've actually discussed one of them that's going to be conducted on animal life and how animals react to eclipses. You can learn more about this in one of the videos in the description. But astronomers and NASA scientists are essentially going to be doing their own studies, mostly on the observations of corona. So for example, for one of the studies that's going to be conducted using sounding rockets, a NASA team is planning to launch three separate rockets before, during and after the eclipse in order to deploy four scientific instruments that are going to measure electric and magnetic field as well as the overall temperature. In case you're not familiar with sounding rockets, these are usually used in atmospheric research in order to study the upper atmosphere. And so about 35 minutes before and 35 minutes after the eclipse, they're going to be collecting all sorts of data in order to discover what sort of atmospheric effects eclipses have on the upper atmosphere of planet Earth. At the same time, NASA is also going to be launching this, WB-57, a super high altitude research aircraft that's going to be capturing all sorts of images of the eclipse from approximately 50,000 feet above the surface. And it's mostly going to be focusing on corona once again. But because it's going to be flying so high up, it's also going to be capturing data on the ionosphere by using a specialized radar designed by NASA. And that's essentially to study how the ionosphere changes during the eclipse and how this affects the rest of the atmosphere. And during this time several other readers are going to be joining in just to confirm the results. And last but not least 
is a team from University of Hawaii. They decided to do something a little bit, I guess, more interesting. Let's just put it that way. In order to avoid the potential cloud cover, they decided to put their instruments on a kite. And a kite is going to be really high up, up to 4 kilometers in the skies. But the main purpose of their study essentially being coronal mass ejections. Mostly because during this time, during the eclipse, the sun is actually going to be also at the peak of its activity. And so they're hoping to catch at least one major ejection and to basically study it with everything they have. But because it could be cloudy and because they don't want to miss this opportunity, which apparently happened to them many times before, they had to find a cheap way to fly their instruments above the cloud cover, which led them to design this somewhat unusual kite. And I'm actually looking forward to their research because it does sound somewhat cool, somewhat unusual, and will potentially provide some really cool results. But that's of course just some of the experiments. I'm definitely going to be talking about more once they're finished and once we have some results, but I guess at least for now, just enjoy the eclipse if you're going to be there, or come back to this channel because I'm most likely going to be streaming it and basically trying to enjoy this with everyone out there. And I'm actually posting a few links in the description with some additional streams, including ones from NASA, that are going to be in super high quality, which will allow you to observe this without being there in person. And for those of you in North America, this is actually going to be your last eclipse for quite some time. The next one is in 2045. And though it's going to be longer and more impressive, 2045 is a pretty long wait. Nevertheless, that one is even going to be even more impressive because it's basically going to go from California to Florida, crossing the United States completely. And so I guess if I'm still making videos by then and YouTube is still around, yeah, I'll be talking about that one too. Much older, probably much grumpier, and most likely with a lot more gray hair. Anyway, we'll come back and talk more about the results and everything else exciting during the eclipse in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, Share this with someone who loves about space and sciences. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support the channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.